So they can't list DSP KY1. Right. So they listed where this brand came from, which was DSP KY16. <laughs> but that's misleading to the consumer. I was, saying, the you know, consumer I, at it, I was just like, wait a second. So now this brand says everything the same, it's still 100 proof, but it doesn't say bottle and bond. Mm -hmm. So I caused that not to happen. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback on last week's episode, and we'll continue it again this week talking about nothing but bottled and bond. March 3rd was the anniversary of the Bottled and Bond Act, so now it's officially 120 years old. And I'm telling you what, everyone in here is going to be in for a treat. So much so, Bernie's going to make us look sort of like idiots at times because he caught us off guard and it kind of felt like we were back in the classroom. It was an enjoyable time being back at Burns Corner. In other news, back on episode 38, we had Turner Moore talk about the Whiskey Obsession Festival. That's happening again in Sarasota, Florida, and tickets are on sale now at whiskeyobsessionfestival.com. To keep this show going, please take a minute and support the show on Patreon. We've got sponsorships starting at just $1 a month that gets you unedited footage, koozies, and of course, limited edition t-shirts. In fact, there is so much extra footage from this episode, there is almost an additional 45 minutes that you can only hear if you're a Patreon supporter. So visit patreon.com. That's P A T R E O N.com slash bourbon pursuit. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Kenny and Ryan here today, and we're with a former guest. And I'm actually very, very happy to be doing this because this is uh, this is kind of what we want to kind of start a, like a small little mini series, I guess you could say. It's been something that Ryan and I have talked about because. We, we always seem to be the ones that might be, I don't know, contributing to the problem that's yeah. in the market today. And, and we want to just start back and, and maybe just go with the basic education, right? And uh, and I'm really excited only because, you know, the guests that we actually had on before, you can catch them in the earlier episodes. We'll, we'll introduce him here in a second. But uh, he, he was strumming his guitar and, and doing some good lyrics for us uh, in preparation for last year's uh, Kentucky Bourbon Affair. Yeah, I'm... I'm super excited about this show. I took an Uber here and uh, <laughs> see all these bottles of bourbon in front of me. I'm, I'm excited, <laughs> so I'm ready to party. No, but uh, yeah, I think I think it's good to get back to basics. We got a lot of people that are jumping into bourbon and they don't quite, you know, understand all the aspects of it. So sometimes we probably, when we talk about things, you're probably like, "What the hell does that mean?" or "What are y'all?" So yeah, I think it's a good idea for us to kind of do a back to basics kind of, you know history of bourbon to get give those new folks something to look forward to and the topic today is is talking nothing but bottled and bond kind of where it started why it started and we actually are we're drinking on some bottled and bond right now that that ryan was uh, nice enough to be able to sample out so ryan kind of just give us a an idea of what we are drinking right here yeah I, so my great aunt i was like hey i've just been asking all my relatives hey do you have any old bottles of bourbon and she's like she's like yeah i got a couple of these it's so she had three uh, old bardstown uh, ball and bonds but it was actually distilled at um heaven hill uh because it says dsp ky 31 so it was distilled there before the fire so not exactly sure what year it is but uh we know it's before the the thing burnt down so well, awesome so let's go ahead and introduce our guests so today we have a return guest to the show so we have bernie lovers bernie is a whiskey ambassador for heaven hill also known as the whiskey professor and if you haven't caught him before make sure you go and check out our past episodes it was number 36 and number 37 where we kind of just talked about heaven hill in general the brands and everything like that so bernie welcome back to the show thanks for having me back all right welcome so, to burns corner that's right that's true you know yeah, we didn't we, really talk about where we're sitting right now are we we're in burns corner and there's a shit ton of bottles <laughs> it's, it's really awesome <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess before we do dive into it, kind of talk a little bit about your collection and and how you go about organizing it, because we can tell that you, you do organize it in a way that you've got all these <laughs> these things that say uh, the number 100 in, in one specific corner. <laughs> yeah, so this is my home bar. And so welcome. So that's uh, the first podcast from my home bar here. Uh, so the way I have uh, my bar arranged, and I don't have, I mean, I know many, many people who have much better collection. They make a lot more money than I do, uh, <laughs> and they can afford a lot more whiskeys than I can. People think I get free stuff all the time. You know, we're a family-owned company at Heaven Hill. 
I don't expect to get, you know, there's some stuff that I do get, but I'm like everybody else. I got to go buy stuff. Um, you know, our, our parkers or whatever. I have to go buy that just like anybody just else. Camp I can't in, camp in line like we did. Yeah, <laughs> it depends. I do have a little connections here yeah. and there, but, uh, but still, you know, I just don't magically, I'm not going to ask uh, Max and Kate and Andy and Alan to, you know, give me a $300 bottle. I mean, that's not fair. Uh, and, and so, you know, so, but, you know, I, so I, I, I love this episode because I like the everyday stuff. I love what we're going to be talking about because I don't want to, you know, there's unicorns are unicorns. They're hard to get a hold of. Yeah. And then once you're finished with them, they're like, Oh God, that's gone. I wish we had that again. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. I want, I want the stuff every day that I can get. But so to the left here, I have all my bottle and bond collection. So there's about 25, 26 uh, bottle and bonds. Uh, some of them uh, you know, don't, don't make any more. Some of them are, are, are from, from years past, but most of them are, are what you can get today. That's pretty cool. So I uh, have that. Then on the right-hand side, uh, as you can notice, there's one little row, about the third row, that has, I uh, have a couple gins, I have a couple rums, a couple, but other than that, this whole bar is nothing but whiskey, uh, basically American whiskey and, and bourbons. Uh, up on the shelves that's are, that are kind of uh, have the barrel uh, barrel hoops in front of them, uh, that's some of my Parker's collection. Those are your uh, unicorns. Those are <laughs> my unicorns. Uh, then I have some import only, some Japanese or some uh, some uh, Korean uh, export only that I'm lucky enough to, to be able to get uh, get a hold of. There's an old IW Harper from the '80s up there. Uh, there's some of my uh, Elijah Craig's uh, 18s and 23s and things like that. And on the very top are some cool uh, cognacs and tequilas up there. So uh, and then I have that's for late night. The, the, late night. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> some of the coolest things I have around here are sample bottles. So and that's the, the what people don't realize is oh you know we can get these unicorns. The unicorny of the unicorns, the unicorniest of the unicorns are samples. It's the stuff that doesn't make it to the show. Yeah, and they're one of a kind bottles usually. So I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the guy in the distillery who's not asking for something free for a unicorn. I'm like, hey, uh, Chris or, 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 or Mike or Danny, uh, Charlie, you got any old samples? You know, and I got some, oh, sure, you, we're going to throw them away or whatever. You know, whatever. I'm like, don't throw me. You know, not that they don't throw them away. But, you know, they were just going to count, like, give them to me. You're so in the lab that's poking the, around. That's the, the unicorniest of the unicorns is the sample bottle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. <laughs> so one thing I want to do is we gotta we gotta justify why you are the uh, I guess you could say the the SME here, the, the subject matter expert. And you've got you've got something that's you've got to justify. I've got to justify every day. <laughs> well, <laughs> go ahead and go ahead and talk about what you have on your arm and and kind of what that means to you in, in regards of uh, you know bottle and bond. Well, I started talking about bottle and bond about ten years ago. I was always I, I, I've only been in the industry for eleven years, so I'm still pretty much a newbie. Um, but when I was growing up here in Kentucky, here in Louisville and around, um, I, I was noticing the, uh, uh, you know, this bottle and bonds. And my best friend's uh, parents, um, the Hallorans, she says that, that, that the old Fitzgerald was their favorite bottle and bond. And I'm like, well, I've seen, you know, a couple other ones around. I've seen this. She goes, well, this is the best. There's nothing better than old Fitzgerald and blah, blah, blah. So I was just always enamored with bottle and bonds. That was the 1980s, you know, I really was just, you know, I was still drinking bourbon and sevens and bourbon and Cokes and bourbon and whatever, you know, it's like, it wasn't, that's what you did. Um, and so uh, I was just, and my dad would say, well, it's the good stuff. I'm like, what does that mean? He really didn't know, I mean, other than it was 100 proof. But he was just saying, oh, that's the good stuff. You know, it's, it says by under government supervision. And, you know, so, so I was just always enthralled. And when I got in the, in the industry, I wanted to learn more about it. And then that's when I started getting into, um, uh, it was Jerry Dalton, who was the master distiller at uh, Jim Beam. And he gave me a copy of the Standards of Identity. And that's when I really started falling in love with uh, the words on labels and the laws that make it. Because if you look today, and it's more important today than it was 10 years ago, um, you know, each word on label, the, the words Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, the words distilled and bottled by, the words bottled in bond, they mean something by federal law. And I was just like, it, just totally enthralled. And now today it's re more relevant than ever because you got so many of these little craft, so-called craft distilleries. Um, I personally just like our, uh, one of our distillers, Denny Potter says, 
we're a craft distillery at Heaven Hill. We're just successful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we all started out making just a few barrels a day, right. you know. So you know, we all started out, you know. But don't blame us that we become successful and and we we're just putting more equipment in. We're still a craft distillery, uh, which explains why people line up for Parkers and line up for our barrel proofs. Those are cra- the craftiest of craft because most craft distilleries don't have anything over six months, eight months, twelve months, twenty four months, thirty six months old. We have things up to twenty three years old. They can't even dream of having, and if they do, they have it. You know, two bottles of it for you know eight thousand dollars a piece, <laughs> much less you know uh, you know available around the country or the world for two hundred dollars or. $30 for a 10 year old, you know, mm-hmm. so it, it means uh, there's something now more than ever today, knowing how to read words on labels for a great everyday bourbons, I think is where people need to go. I've been preaching it for 10 years now <laughs> and now it's become more, more of, uh, you know, so I can look at that bottle that you brought in mm-hmm. and pretty much tell you. And you, I mean, you nailed it right on the head. You said, I know this is from Heaven Hill because it says DSP KY31. Well, bang, right there. That's the importance of Bottle and Bond. You must list who made it. And you must list the specific distilled spirits plant number. So you, you, you don't know where a lot of this stuff comes from. If it's sourced, you know, uh, for a company, you know, who are this? Who, who, who is this? Well, with Bottle and Bond, you know exactly who made it. So you don't know much about that brand. But you know exactly who made it and almost when. You know, it doesn't have a tax stamp on it, so it's after the 70s. It's before the fire, so it's before, you know, 1996. So we've pretty much pegged, you know, we know it's four years old. There's no age statement on it. By law, a bottle and bomb must be a minimum of four years old. If it was older than that, they'd brag about it. Right? <laughs> yeah, so exactly. It has to be, so bottle and bond has to be from one specific season. So we know that's four years old and from Heaven Hill Distilleries. And it's fantastic. Yeah. There you go. So I guess that's that's a good way to kind of start kicking it off and, and really getting into the reason why. I guess let's let's rewind back to uh, 18, middle of 1800s and, and the reason why, um, you know, this bottled and bond really started making a presence and, and what was the real issue or necessity behind it? Well, there's always several reasons for everything. There's not one, one thing. There's a lot of things happening in the, in the, in the late 1800s. You've got the, uh, after the civil war, you've got a tax, a big tax that's put on, on whiskey. Basically that's what people are drinking is whiskey. They make, they drink whiskey, they drink brandy, right? They drink cognac down in new Orleans. Um, there's a little bit of gin, but whiskey's the big deal. Uh, that, um, and we had put a tax on uh, after every war. We we tend to have like to have a lot of wars. Uh, so the Revolutionary War, there was a tax, and then Thomas Jefferson did away with that tax. Remember, there was the Whiskey Rebellion after the after that that uh, George Washington put the tax on, and uh, Jefferson did away with it. After the War of 1812, there was a tax, and then it was when things were paid off, they did away with the tax. But after Civil War, it stuck. So now we got taxes. Then you have the immigration going on. Um, you have, you know, there was a wave of immigration before the Civil War, and there was a wave of immigration afterwards. So you had Ellis Island, a thousand immigrants a day uh, through um, uh, from Asia and China. You had a thousand immigrants a day coming through San Francisco and uh, Angel Island. This was before the wall. This is uh, <laughs> Donald Trump would have hated this time. Right? Been a lot of vetting. There been a lot of holding up yeah. there. At the, there wouldn't be a thousand. There'd be ten to get through that day. Um, and then through New Orleans, where my grandparents and uh, Max Shapiro's grandparents uh, came through from Lithuania, mine from Germany, came through uh, New, New Orleans, the port of New Orleans. So a thousand immigrants a day. They're they're not rich, right? They don't have a lot of money, but whatever they have left over, they like to have a little drink. You know, after they work real hard, they're building railroads. They're building dams and and bridges and dangerous crappy dirty jobs you know and like like to have a belt after the thing right so they they couldn't afford what we were calling this straight whiskey which was there's no laws for any of this that the the, the distillers around here were calling straight whiskey whiskey that hadn't that the barrel gave all the flavor to and the color to so basically adding just water to you know um to get it down to whatever uh, strength uh, and people liked a good high strength um, and then you had what they were calling compound whiskey Pappy Van Winkle uh, Sally Van Winkle Campbell she, she writes about this in uh, But Only Fine Bourbon um, the compound whiskey had things added to it so you're basically taking neutral grain spirits 
Everclear, okay? You remember being in high school, having oh, yeah. a party with Everclear? <laughs> and now when you it had a... badly. Yeah. We were, <laughs> so what did you do to that Everclear for your guests to make it so you could drink it? Tons oh, of you, fruit punch. Fruit punch. <laughs> Actually, we used to use like uh, powdered Gatorade mix and just put that yeah, like yeah. directly Crystal into lights. it. Yeah, because then... Call it the knockout. Because at that point, you're not even diluting. You're just flavoring it at that yeah. point. So you were doing exactly what rectifiers were doing back in the late 1800s. They were taking... Everclear and adding fruit juices and flavors to it. So you were doing exactly what they were doing, and but they but they were then taking and putting a whiskey label on it. So if you read Mike Veach's book, uh, Bourbon Whiskey and American Heritage, or Fred Minnick's book, Bourbon Curious, if you don't, um, if they talk about some of these recipes where they would add juices like cherry juice and prune juice, um, things like tobacco spit to give it a little texture, and, and that they would add iodine for color to give it that amber color right because it had to look they thought it had to look like whiskey and they would slap a whiskey label on it there was nothing against the law about that so that didn't set very well with some of these distillers around here who were making what they called straight whiskeys right uh then you had also a gentleman uh i guess i guess before we go there i mean when people were were mixing and and taking those kinds of whiskeys i mean were people still buying them and drinking them because if i think about it if if I mean, technically, like, legally, it wouldn't be able to happen today. But if you put something on the market, the market's going to test it, and then they're going to say, "Well, I'm just not going to buy it anymore." So, what was what was the reason why people just because you still had bought these it? people from China and Europe and different places who couldn't afford this this straight whiskey? If that's what you can afford, that's what you buy, and there was nothing on a label to protect you from anything. You thought it was whiskey, so you bought whiskey, right? So there was nothing to protect you, right? There was no consumer protection laws out there. It was indeed the Wild West. It was indeed the Wild West. And then you had uh, Julius Kessler. I think he was from Austria. Uh, so he is a merchant, and he's a and he has a, a distillery, and he sees an opportunity, and he's going to start this thing called the Whiskey Trust. And the Whiskey Trust, of course, anytime there's the word trust in something. You know, you got to be, my, my antennas go up, my little spidey <laughs> senses, you know, this guy's going to screw me, right? Or whatever. So <laughs> look out. Don't trust this guy. He, he meant, well, I think he, I think he just saw the opportunity as, as most, as a, as a business person to take advantage of something and to sell more stuff. So I don't think he did anything maliciously, but he wanted to be able to, he wanted to sell directly to the bar. He wanted to sell directly to the people who were selling it. He didn't want to go through any other channels, right? So he wanted to sell directly through. There wasn't any laws about having to have dis- the distributors. Distributors were were handy to have because they had sales forces and things. But you could make more money if you sold direct. So he was trying to get this through. And, of course, he's, he's, he makes compound whiskey. But he makes it good. He's not putting in tobacco spit and cherry juice and prune juice he's adding more things more like a caramel coloring or things like we do today you know he was basically natural the, you know, organic <laughs> organic so, you additives. know if you know kessler's today that's julius kessler okay that's a blended american blended whiskey like a seagram seven you know like a kentucky deluxe we got a brand called kentucky deluxe or whatever um and they're all they're all um you know blended which today means basically everclear with caramel coloring sugars flavors added to it to make it look smell and taste like whiskey yeah. and that's what we now today call blended whiskey but they were calling that stuff compound whiskey back then and so he was saying i got a safe compound whiskey that you can trust it's not going to make you go blind it's not going to add whatever <laughs> and plus he's making more money so he tried to get all these people together well the folks in kentucky and different areas who made this what we call straight whiskey they law they they were they were they had an advocate in Washington, and if you watch Boardwalk Empire, he appears in there. That's uh, John Carlyle, and he is the Secretary of Treasury of the United States. So he's important because his agents hold the keys to the distillery that had to also have a key with the master distiller to get in, had to have both keys to get in, and they levied the taxes in these bonded warehouses. You know, well before bonded warehouses, they they levied the taxes. This is before that. So um, he's important. Through other distillers lobbying for it, not all were for. Not all distillers were for this. Uh, I.W. Bernheim was not for this. You know, government regulation, sorry. See you later. I mean, I can understand it. Um, I think he'd be glad that it went through. But that's in 1997. 
um, is when the Bottle and Bond Act, and we're coming up on the anniversary. Uh, Mike Beach and myself and a few other people are going to be out and around in Louisville uh, that night at Haymarket and Proof and a couple other places. So March 3rd, 1897 is when this act was passed. And so we're 120 years now in, into it. And that's when the Bottle and Bond Act was passed. And that's actually the very first consumer protection legislation in the history of the United States before we had any protection on anything. Nine years before the safe labeling of our food in the Pure Food and Drug mm -hmm. Act of 1906. So nine years before we cared about the labeling and safe labeling of our food, we cared more about the quality of our whiskey. Another reason to be proud to be an American. Right? <laughs> there you go. And that's when the Bottle and Bond Act was passed and the laws were set down of what Bottle and Bond meant. And that's three of those most important words that are on your so, label. So why did they pick 100 proof or... Four years. I can understand the four, but why 100 proof? Why not 90 or 80? You know, as you've seen mo a lot of brands proof at today. Absolutely. So even today, we have something called a proof gallon. And that's what the government cares about because that's how they make their money. So one gallon of spirits at 50% alcohol is a proof gallon. And today we pay $13.50 per proof gallon. So, no, no so once you pay taxes on that, then you can water it down to 80. 80 is the lowest any whiskey can be in the United States. So it can't be below 40% alcohol or 80 proof. But you can be any proof up to barrel proof all the way down to 80 proof. But you've already paid taxes on the aggregate amount you have of whatever you're paying taxes and bottling on, which is 50% alcohol of one gallon. And then you times that by how many gallons you got, and that's how much money you owe the government. So that's why they chose 100 proof, because that's Sounds a Sounds like gallon. a lot of taxes. We pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> That's right. So what we kind of want to rewind back to the, the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897. And when I think about it, is there any kind of um, statute of limitations or anything like that? Because is this today is still what can be considered a, a legal binding uh, you know, piece of history? Absolutely it is. And I had somebody swore it was a marketing campaign. <laughs> that it was like a small batch or very limited or whatever, special reserve or whatever. And there aren't any laws on, on those, uh, like small batch or whatever. Um, uh, and that's not, that, it's kind of marketing, but that's kind of, you know, Booker, Booker no, coined the phrase small batch. But here in front of me, here is the standards of identity of uh, distilled spirits. Subpart C, Standards of Identity for Distilled Spirits of the TTB, the Tax and Trade Bureau, page 48, lists all <laughs> the laws which makes neutral spirits or alcohol neutral spirits, grain spirits, whiskey, bourbon whiskey, rye whiskey, wheat whiskey, malt whiskey, rye malt whiskey, corn whiskey, straight whiskeys, all defined here. So these are on the books, and this is what we are, we are, we have to... It's, it's like the Constitution, right? It's, it's not. It's our. Yeah. It's our. You know, and it are laws. So you you have to. It's the ways they're interpreted. You know, they're in there. You can tell each section's not very long, but you could debate a couple of points in here of things. But it tells well, you specifically what things are. I so, guess. I guess. Mm -hmm. what, what could you debate? I guess that's a good question, right? Yeah. Well, we'll go and through. We'll just read anybody it. So to here's, it. when I tell people. These are the most, when you're walking through a whiskey aisle, I love watching people today, you know, because there's 200 whiskeys in American whiskeys about, and there's new ones coming out every day. And I'm always fascinated and I'll watch them. And you can tell when somebody doesn't know they're buying a gift. That's usually the people who don't know much are buying a gift for uncle Fred or something. And so they're looking and they're like, and they're looking at bottle shapes. And it's one reason why we do spend time sometimes making different bottle shapes and, you know, ornate bottles. You know, a lot of our old bottles are just what we call standard tall rounds. You know, there's, that's this old Fitz bottle or that JTS Brown bottle, right? Or the Mellow Corn bottle, the JW Dan. That's just a basic tall round. There's nothing, you know, you can't look at that until that's a brand. Well, you can look at an old one of our Elijah Craig bottles or one of our new Elijah Craig bottles and go, that's Elijah Craig. I mm -hmm. mean, it's like that old Absolute Vodka ad. You see the bottle shape. That's it. Coca-Cola, that's they hang their head on that. You know, you see the, the, that just that outline of the Coca-Cola bottle. Damn it, that's a Coca-Cola bottle, right? You can look at a Jack bottle sometimes and go, that's Jack Daniels, you know, or, or you know, whatever. So 
there is some marketing that go obviously that goes in. We're in the. I tell people all the time, we are in the bourbon business, not the bourbon charity. Okay? <laughs> There's some things we do to make money. Sorry, you know, absolutely, we're not sorry because you know we wouldn't be able to do this and yeah, have these great the whiskeys if we didn't make money, right? So we got to make money first and foremost. So no apologies for that, but you can't get by these words on labels that mean things. So when I do trainings around the country and around the world, I tell people that these words, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, distilled and bottled by, bottled in bond. These are like Boy Scouts earning badges or military men and women earning medals. If you're a Boy Scout and you learn how to build a fire, if you want to get that badge, you've got to demonstrate that skill. And then you receive the badge and you wear it on your chest with pride because not everybody in the troop has been able to win that badge. If you're an expert marksman, you wear that medal on your chest with pride because not everyone in your, in your, uh, in, in, on your base has that. You have that along with a few selected people. So you look at, you look at these words on labels. Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. There's our badges and our medals. So we look at the laws. And if you read on here, so we're gonna we're gonna read whiskey. So I'm gonna have you read. I'll read. <laughs> I'll read one. Class two whiskey. Class two read, whiskey. Just read that definition. Class two whiskey. Well, I'd sip my four-year-old old barn. <laughs> there you go. And that's that's whiskey with a Y, <laughs> not an E-Y in this. And that's isn't right. that interesting that there's no E in any of the standards of my Exactly. Name? And it says it's an alcoholic distillate from a fermented mash of grain produced at less than 190 proof in such a manner that distillate possesses the taste, aroma, and characteristics generally attributed to whiskey stored in oak containers, except that corn whiskey not need to be stored and bottled at no less than 80 proof and also includes mixtures of such distillates for which no specific standards of identity are prescribed. Mm -hmm. So, any grain... In layman's terms. <laughs> <laughs> so the way I interpret that is any grain anywhere in the world. Bottled up to any proof in the scientific world, about 190 is the highest you can, unless you're in space, you can get it up to 194 or something like that. I was about to say, 190 is up there, You know, right? Everclear is basically 190 proof, right? So, so, so any grain, any in the world, distilled up to any proof, I've just described vodka, right? So what makes it whiskey? Stored in oak. And then it has to look and smell and taste like whiskey. And to do that, I can add whatever I can, uh, any other materials to it. To make it look, smell, and taste like whiskey, because I basically just made vodka. So just like in the 1800s, I can make neutral spirits and add my cherry juice, prune juice, tobacco spit, or today, caramel coloring, sugars to make it look, smell, and, and colors to make it look, smell, and taste like whiskey. So there's whiskey. Mm -hmm. So there's the whiskey badge. That's not vodka, right? Because we had to buy a barrel or have some sort of oak. You know, it doesn't say barrel, it's just oak. So you got you, you got to make a little bit more. It's not just vodka or Everclear. So we get the whiskey badge if it says the word whiskey on it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So now oh, Ryan, it's not just Ryan's whiskey. Up. Ryan's up now. <laughs> We're bourbon whiskey. So underneath here's whiskey, and the next one is bourbon whiskey. So one bourbon one. whiskey, and you'll be surprised to see that bourbon whiskey is not the only whiskey. That it defines. There's, I, I there's feel, several here. I feel like I feel like we're in the classroom, and then the teacher is calling on you to make I sure know. you can read. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, grade school teachers, I failed you. Uh, so, bourbon whiskey, rye whiskey, wheat whiskey, malt whiskey, or rye malt whiskey is whiskey produced at not exceeding 160 proof from a fermented mash of not less than 51% corn, rye, wheat, malted barley, or malted rye grain respectively, and stored at not more than 125 proof in charred new oak containers and also includes mixtures of such whiskeys of the same type. So how does that differ from just whiskey? It's not just any grain, right? Specific grains. So it's 51% of those specific grains. So if you're making bourbon, it has to be at least 51% corn. 
If you're making rye, it must be at least 51% rye. If you're making wheat whiskey, or as Stewie Griffin would say, wheat whiskey. Wheat whiskey. Uh, like our Bernheim wheat whiskey. <laughs> that has to be at least 51% wheat. Wheat thins. Wheat thins. If, it, wheat thins. If, if, if it's malt whiskey, it must be at least 51% malt. And if it's rye malt whiskey, it must be at least 51% rye malt. Then after that, it all shares. It must be aged in not just oak, but brand new charred oak every single time. Not just oak, like whiskey. And there's a further uh, 125, no more than 125 proof to be stored in. Whiskey, you could store it to 190. But not bourbon, rye, malt, rye, malt. So, and then I can't add any other color. It has to be only mixed with the other stuff just like it. So that's a big restriction, right? right? So that's another badge. I guess a good question to ask you before we get back to this is, you know, it says you can you can make all these different types of whiskeys. How come when we see in the market today, it's just it's flooded with just kind of bourbon whiskey? There's nothing. There's not a whole lot of rye whiskeys or malt whiskeys or anything like well, that. I know rye's out there now. I know rye bottle and a bond. You got you got Rittenhouse, right? And then and uh, the H Taylor and H Taylor. Okay, mm-hmm. so other than that, I'm not too sure what else is out there. Well, we got Mellow Corn, which is the only bottle and bond straight corn whiskey in the world, which is which is the next. Uh, definition out here because its laws are different. It's your mm-hmm. turn. Yeah, <laughs> you've got. But yes, that's the whole idea of this, and you're really getting it, is that you can make all this, right? And at Heaven Hill, we're the only ones that do. We're the only major distiller that makes every style of American whiskey. Right now, you you hit the nail right on the head. People are only making bourbon, maybe maybe rye, the big the big boys, mm-hmm. right? the big boys and girls. Uh, why? That's selling. Why aren't they making other things? Well, it's not a big, there's not big Markets demands there, for it, yeah. and there's not a lot of money, and they are owned by stockholders, and Wall Street is looking at them saying, you better drive profits every single month, every single quarter, or your stock price is going down. Well, it doesn't make any sense for them to have a straight corn whiskey that's aged, because... It doesn't make, you know, that's, that's a small little category. Right. We sell probably less than 10,000 cases of that a year. Looks like it's popular here, though, because mm-hmm. it's about empty. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great one here at Burns Corner. It's very popular. Right? Uh, so in rye whiskey, you know, it took everybody by surprise. So unless you were, unless you were Wild Turkey, uh, Heaven Hill, Jim Beam, Buffalo Trace, uh, you didn't have rye whiskey. And just recently, Brown Foreman got into the Woodford rye and that they didn't have rye whiskey before that. And that's why everybody went to MGP to buy that 95.5 rye because nobody had any rye whiskey. And the only place you could buy it from was not one of us because we ha- didn't. We barely had enough for what we had. You had to go buy it from somebody who was just sitting on the barrel sitting back there that nobody paid attention to. And that's why how that became such a big player. Right. But yeah. And so we think it's just a matter of time before people catch up to the wheat whiskey and, and corn whiskey. And now we have our uh, a malt whiskey that was Parker's a couple of years ago. It'll probably be an everyday thing. So we're way ahead of the, you know, being a family owned company, you can be ahead of a curve. That, that come, that's coming. Cause if you love, you just, you just read that all those have the same restrictions they must be great whiskeys, right? They're made just like bourbon and rye. Right. So it's about to be aged at, at least four God, years. Yeah. Man, I want some. You yeah. know, <laughs> what does it taste like? You know, yeah. so it's pretty cool. Let's try it. So let's, yeah, let's try it. Uh, so now uh, you got the corn whiskey. So you say it's a popular one here, and it is. I'll read the definition for corn whiskey. Now, you kind of, this, the, the whiskey, it, it, this, it says, except corn whiskey need not to be stored. It's only whiskey, one of the only whiskeys I know doesn't have to be stored. Because whiskey has to be stored in oak, except that exception. Right? Mm-hmm. So corn whiskey doesn't have to be. Why is that? Who, who lobbied? I think he's going to tell you. <laughs> I, don't know. About to find out. I don't know why. I don't know the why. So, uh, uh, but it's, it's there. Uh, corn whiskey is whiskey produced not exceeding 160 proof. That's the same as bourbon and rye. Boy. It's got, boy, we're starting out still pretty, pretty restricted. Similar, right? Pretty yeah. restricted. Um, uh, from a fermented mash of not just 51%, but corn whiskey has to be at least 80%. Uh, and if, sto- if stored, because it says up here it doesn't have to be, but if you do store it, it must be uh, stored at no more than 125 proof. Wow, that's just like bourbon and mm-hmm. rye and all that. Mm-hmm. I thought corn whiskey was just some cheap shit. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, wait a minute. This is made with the same, you know, it's big standards. In used or uncharred new oak, 
two different types we can use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not subjected in any manner to treatment with charred wood and also excludes mixtures of such whiskey. So it has to be other types of corn whiskeys mingled in there. So here's where the little interpretation comes in. Uh, it just says, not with charred, but it says used. And most our barrels are charred, they're used. Right. So we, but, but we can still use charred, use charred. It's been used once. So there's an interpretation, and you were asking about interpretation. Yeah, I got so, you. So, so you could actually have something that was uncharred that might not have the flavor characteristics that you would get in mellow corn because it is actually been in a used charred yeah, barrel. And, and we use a once used Evan Williams barrel, okay, because we have them. Mm -hmm. right? We, we dump a thousand of them a day. So we got we'll just fill them up a second time. And it's not like, that, and that's one reason why corn whiskey isn't as, it doesn't cost as much as bourbon whiskey we've used the tea bag the second time so we're getting one more hit out of it right <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah. and that's one reason why it's a light straw color because it's not getting the big vanillas and all those they know they the, the thin, thin. All yeah. before. right but <laughs> with corn whiskey you want that it's not that we're saving money it's for making corn whiskey not bourbon whiskey if you take a corn distillate and age it in a brand new chardo container the corn flavor with the, the science that's happening inside that barrel is the corn flavor becomes neutral and only the sweetness remains. And then you have bourbon or rye or wheat or malt. If you age a corn distillate in a used chard or brand new unchard, the corn flavor remains. And it tastes like corn. Mm -hmm. huh? So isn't that like cool? Th like Thanksgiving dinner, right? <laughs> yeah. It also has to be at least 80% corn. People think that's the big difference. It's not. Mm -hmm. It does have to be at least 80% corn. But if we took that 80% corn whiskey, same recipe we make for mellow corn in Georgia Moon, uh, and put that in a charred new oak container, it's going to taste pretty damn much like Evan Williams. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. We got Evan Williams, right? right. <laughs> we we want to have every style of American whiskey, so we, we have mellow corn then. And it becomes this beautiful, raw spirit that and we'll taste some here in a second. Uh, that uh, that it is. So just grab that. There's only yeah. a little bit in there, but you know, pour, pour a little in your glass there. You guys are a little empty. I'm talking. It's okay. So there's beer. there's there's corn whiskey. Yeah. So fine. That's awesome. So we are we are getting into some of those pieces about mm -hmm. it, and definitely getting into some. In of those. a different batch. That's a different batch than bourbon. Yeah. But it's still. Did you hear all the restrictions? Oh yeah. So why you know why wouldn't you want some? You know, it's pretty cool. Did he leave you any? He's gonna, you're gonna have to have him taste well, it. It's okay. Yeah, we'll, pass it <laughs> we'll be yeah, all right. I was right. at the very. We, we, I got to get the help down to the basement. And get get more mellow corn. Out. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Damn, that's actually pretty tasty. Isn't it great? Yeah. It's that raw. It tastes like corn. Oh, yeah. It's like kettle corn with a kick. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Now it's not bourbon, so you can't. It you is different. You it can't different. put it up against what we're drinking here and go. Even though they're both four years old and both 100 proof and both bottle and bomb and pretty damn near the same recipe, that shows you what a brand new charred oak barrel does. Yep. And most whiskeys of the world, Canadian, Irish, Scotch, Japanese, all aged in used barrels. Mm -hmm. So what a great illustration to bring alive the difference between a brand new and a and used, used barrel. Yeah. Man, now I can understand when you go into class right now and you have you have your Elijah Craig or your Evan Williams and then you got your mellow corn next to it and you hear this spiel, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can that's awesome. And the spiel is the laws. There's no getting around the laws. There's no marketing yeah. talk here. This is all the laws, right? Then so, we look at the word straight. We got another question. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go one more into it to straight and then we'll uh, we'll kind of proceed a little bit. Find straight here. It's a few it's a few pages back. Uh, pop quiz about 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Whiskeys conforming to the standards prescribed in paragraphs above that have been stored in the type of oak containers prescribed, which for corn whiskey would be? Oak. or oh. new, uh, Let's see. It can be brand new oak. You know, or it can be a quiz, be, right? Or it can be a used yeah. char barrel. Or for bourbon and rye. Has to be a new oak. Right? Charred barrel. So that's why yeah. it says the types of, 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 of barrels, pres containers prescribed. They don't list the kind because they all have different ones. Um, for a period of two years or more shall be further designated as straight. So the word straight means it has to be aged in the appropriate types of containers for a minimum of two years. Got it. So we earn that batch. So look for those words. Straight bourbon whiskey, straight rye whiskey, straight corn whiskey. Straight corn. Mm -hmm. This means it's at least two years old. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's got that badge. Yeah. And a lot of your craft distillers to today don't earn those badges because they can't wait two years. You know, they've 
their brother-in-law is a neurosurgeon and gave you five million dollars to build this <laughs> distillery right and you know you go out and you start distilling and you go well shit we got to pay some of this money. my brother-in-law wants his money back right so i've got to you know we got to start selling this stuff let's see uh, we got to get this stuff so good whiskey's good at six months right we can do that right and there's a lot of it out there there's a ton of six and eight and ten month and twelve month old whiskey out there that people are spending fifty sixty eighty dollars a bottle for and they're on the shelf right now and people are just gobbling them up because a bottle looks great. Oh my God, it's eighty dollars. It must be good. And it's craft. <laughs> oh, let me look at this. Let me look at this uh, uh, mellow corn. Ah, it's twelve dollars. Huh. Nah, it doesn't even have very good color to it. I'm, 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 nah, now nah, I'll buy this. Look other, at that bottle. I'll shape. buy this other shit. I'll buy, yeah. I'll buy the hundred dollar bottle. So I mean, that's what happens. And so words on labels mean things. And if you think that's not very good, it's it's some of the most restricted whiskeys in the world, right? And then you got Kentucky, another great word on there, which I think now means more than ever. Based in here, it just says it's the state of distillation. Right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be uh, distilled and aged in that state. Right. Uh, Kentucky. And then, and then I guess one thing to hit on the last piece of it is so the why the four years? Is that where the, the bottled and bond comes in is the four year mark? Bingo. Okay. The student's going to do well. Ah, That's right. Get my dunce cap. <laughs> Pick that off now. Yeah. <laughs> but think about Kentucky now. How important is Kentucky? 95% of the world's bourbon comes from a 60 mile radius of where we're sitting here at Burns Corner. Okay. So why, why did that happen? Well, it must be a pretty good area to make whiskey, right? Yeah. Plus after prohibition, this is where a lot of the distilleries were. I could say it could have been dumb luck. There were some in Illinois, there were some in Indiana, there were some in Tennessee, you know, how come it's lasted here? Well, we had, first of all, we had the families who distilled it. The Beam family, for one. A lot of distillers in the Beam family. We have Beams in our distillery. Uh, there's Beams over there. There was Beams at uh, Elmo Beam. It was the first distillery at Maker's Mark. If you're a Beam, you knew how to make whiskey. It was pretty important. Not every state has people who know, you know, like I said, if you have that neurosurgeon and he gives you $5 million and you go to Vendome and buy a still and you sit it there, do you know how to turn it on? <laughs> No, you know, you need experience and, you know, just tinkering around with it. And you're like, hey, I made my first run. Well, shit, I'm, I'm the master distiller here at Bob's, you know, that's how, they, that's how they do it. So, you know, it's amazing, right? And here's an $80 bottle that's six months old. Oh, I'd love to buy it. Enjoy you know? it. Yeah. <laughs> so I can just see all the crap distillers that are listening oh, to this no. just cracking they're, up. They're cringing. They're like, that's hey, our plan. <laughs> I didn't say all. I had one, one example of a guy's brother-in-law who's an early surgeon. Right? There's other people who study and go to school who do this, and there's a lot of great ones out there that are doing a phenomenal, great job, and I can run through a list if you want. They're my favorites. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, Coursera, I think, has done an amazing job. And Bowling Green and Nashville, I think they've just done an amazing job of what they're doing uh, uh, and how they're doing it. But, you know, they didn't just get $5 million from their brother-in-law. So I don't mean to step on anybody. <laughs> no, it's, it's quite, one it's example right. of this guy, Bob. Uh, Bob's. So, uh, uh, so, so Kentucky, we have the experience. Um, not everybody has eight, nine generations of a Bean family or f three or four generations of the Russell family and, you know, Jimmy Rutledge hanging around and, and uh, Greg Davis over here at Maker's Mark who, you know, learned how to brew and then was, was at Barton and learned, came up through the ranks and you know, kind of stuff. We have a lot of great experience. We also have the limestone water, remember? We got this shelf under here that sits there, but, you know, let's be honest, 2017, you can fix water. Um, <laughs> uh, we also, have, Moses. We also Moses. have four extreme seasons. You know, we have spring and fall, then we have winter and summer. That's because, what I try to say is you cannot duplicate our weather. Yeah. It's like it was 70 two weeks ago, and now, mm -hmm. you know, today it was 28. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't duplicate that anywhere else in the country. It gets over 100 degrees in July and August. It gets zero or below zero in the wintertime. So not everybody has that. So we need that to move that whiskey in and out of, this, out of these barrels. So the question I pose to people is, do you want Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey or do you want Florida straight bourbon whiskey? And they always chuckle. Well, of course you want Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, right? Because we have, their water's not very good, but like I said, you can fix water. <laughs> you can fix water. Let's be honest. You can fix water. You can hire Brita, a team of Brita engineers yeah. to figure that out. I don't even know if I want North Dakota straight bourbon whiskey because it's all cold, no hot. And where's the movement coming from? So where is that? And where does, okay, uh, Mr. Distiller, you've been open for uh, two years now. Where do you find your whiskey tastes best in your, in your warehouse? 
oh, wait a minute, you don't have warehouses, right? <laughs> because you're not in Kentucky and you don't have the Buzics to build your warehouses. They're the only people who build them, right? So that's another thing to make Kentucky whiskey, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey is because we have those rick houses. You go to distillers out in Colorado and Washington, they're in a building that's just like a warehouse. It's heated and it's cooled and their barrels sit on top of each other in those metal racks like they, you see them at wineries. Yeah, That's not a rick house. That's not getting extreme temperatures in the summertime and the wintertime. That's just, you know, you got it set on 60, you know. So you, you can only get that here. So there's a reason it's here. And Kentucky means more in a label now than ever because it's being made in all 50 states probably. And we can, we're going to agree with you on that. There's no bigger gonna... advocate than that than Kenny. <laughs> Trust me. He's, he's all Kentucky, which I am too. I'm but. kind of a snob about it, <laughs> yeah. but that's, that's with, with good reason too. So let's, let's go ahead and let's, let's get back to the topic at hand right now. And one of the things I kind of want to talk about it back again with the, you know, harp on the bottle and bond act a little bit. Uh, you know, you, you kind of talked a while, um, Isaac Wolf Bernheim, I.W. Bernheim and, and why he didn't, why he was kind of a, a you know, he was against this. Uh, why was he against I don't that? know. I haven't done that research. Uh, you know, my guess is, like anybody else, he would. I mean, this is the first time that the government wanted to get into somebody's business. Right. That's that's a slippery slope. You had a lot of people who came. He came from Europe. I think he was from uh, Germany. Uh, Bernheim. It's the uh, house of Bernie. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> Bernheim. Yeah. My 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 gross Elton is from Oldenburg, Deutschland. Yeah. So I'm German. No, nope, not a thing. So. Uh, you know, they came from places that had, you know, the king, the Kaiser, and then they remember they they been a, they'd been oppressed. To have government come yep. into you, I think that'd be a hard thing. Once they start regulating one thing, what else are yeah. they going to regulate? And that's my guess at best. I haven't done the research for that, but mm-hmm. they, you know, but he. So they were conservatives. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I would think so. I would think he was also a businessman, but. I think I think as it turned out, I think he he would uh, say that it would it turned out pretty good. Yeah, you know. So and you wouldn't know hindsight is twenty twenty. So you say that you know is this just a whatever? Uh, we just read those laws. There were little paragraphs. Here's the law of bottle and bond. It's the whole page. Mm-hmm. Okay, and this is on my website. All these laws. These are these are. Yeah, you can actually go to my website whiskeyprof. Dot com. I'm not trying to get people off your off yours. No, it's okay. <laughs> but if you wanted to see these and read these along, you can read along with 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 us today. Uh, you can do that. Uh, so there's the laws of what makes bottle and bond. So on top of that, on top of these laws here, and I'll go through them real quickly. Uh, the words bond, bottle and bond, aged and bond, uh, phrases containing these are synonymous terms. Shall not be used on any label as any part of the brand of domestic distilled spirits. Spirits, not just whiskey. Yeah. Uh, unless it, 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 it conforms to the following. So right there, we're learning that it has to be a domestic. It has to be made in the United States. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you, it's hard to uh, have laws for any other country. So right, yeah, I can't really impose, <laughs> impose that. Yeah. So uh, compose the same kind of spirit produced from the same class of materials. So there's a little, there's a little interpretation there. Uh, does that mean I can't mix corn whiskey with bourbon whiskey? I think that's probably, what it kind of says. Yeah. The same kind of spirits. Uh, same, so you can't, you, you have, it has to be that one thing. Uh, produced in the same distilling season by the same distiller at the same distillery. That's saying one location. That's, that's one it. location. And then one distilling season. You remember the old, um, I don't know if I have any around here, uh, the old uh, tax stamps that used to say spring and mm-hmm. fall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are the two seasons. So spring is January through June. Fall is July through December. So it's a finite number of barrels you make in one six month period. That's why you don't find these brands are four million case brands or you will never find that because it's a finite number of barrels. So it's like a, res- a, 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 a vintage, if you will, a reserve, you know, it's only this uh, stored for a minimum of four years, straights two, bottle and bond now is four. Right? In wooden containers where the spirits have been in contact with the wood surface, except for gin and vodka. Have you ever seen a gin and vodka bottle and bond? Here's why. Which must be stored for at least four years in wooden containers coated or lined with paraffin or other substance which preclude the contact of the spirits with the wood surface. So you, I think I got, I got to think that the, stiller, the, the, the whiskey distillers did this. It's like, screw, those, screw yeah, who, those guys. Who's going to put paraffin inside well, the container? Well, you know, they, they can make vodka and gin today, sell it tonight. we got to wait four years. Are you kidding me? we got to put a law on there, so they got to wait. And they didn't want theirs to be affected by the wood, so they said, we go to line it with paraffin. You can see how this <laughs> mm-hmm. goes. goes. Um, um, 
and uh, so just uh, pure water only reduced and proofed by the addition of pure water only to 100 degrees there's your proof there gallon is. yep okay uh, and bottled exactly at 100 proof in addition to the requirements the label shall bear the real name of the distillery uh, or the trade number which the distillery produced in warehouse of spirits and the plant or registered distillery number which produced okay also the plant in which it bottled so you not only got to make it at one place you got to tell the real name of the distillery and we own a few real names you know okay we have heaven hill we have evan williams we have elijah craig that still could be a i'm confused mm -hmm. but just like you cut your through confusion you got to put the dsp the distilled spirits plant number of which distilled it and if the if they bottled it at a separate plant you got to put that on there. Now that one says so Stonegate Distillery, but it's DSP. But that's the real name of the distillery that owned that name. Yeah, that might not be a Heaven Hill name, but that's the real name of the distillery. But if you still wanted to further know, you read that and knew exactly it was DSP KY thirty one. That is as transparent as you can possibly get. And on here. It says distilled and bottled by DSP KY1. Mm -hmm. Remember, we had the fire. Yeah, so Bernheim. now Bernheim is DSP KY1, but also it says DSP KY31 because that's our bottling plant. So when I say that bottle and bond, it has all the badges. It has all the medals. So that's the Eagle Scout. Right? It's got all the badges. Mm -hmm. It's the Navy SEAL or the Green Beret. It's got all the medals. Why wouldn't you have every single one that's made like <laughs> Burns Corner does? <laughs> and when people come over here, as you all are, I mean, I've got a lot of great stuff. And there's no require. I don't say you can't have this or that. This is what they drink. Because it's good stuff you can get every day yep. at a great price. Absolutely. And that's why Bottle and Bond's important today, more important than ever. So talk a little bit more about the kind of- kind I'm gonna pour some. Yeah, yeah, please do, please do. I, I wanna talk a little bit about <laughs> the, uh, the masterminds that, that were kind of behind this. You know, you, you kind of mentioned uh, the Secretary of Treasury at the time, George, or sorry, John Carlyle. Mm -hmm. um, and his picture was in the, in the tax stamps. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But I kind of want to also talk about um, maybe, I, you know, people think of, of Colonel Taylor kind of being associated pretty heavily with this because mm -hmm. he's got a long history of just being inside of lawsuits. Did he, I mean, is I've that- I've also read that Ezra Brooks was really important. They, they were more lobbyists. Mm -hmm. So Colonel Taylor didn't write the law. I think that John Carlisle probably, they all, he was from Kentucky. I think they all knew each other. And I think he said, you know, hey, I need some help. I mean, Colonel Taylor was, was uh, the, good old uh, the mayor. Club. He was a mayor yeah. too of Frankfurt, wasn't he? He was a mayor. He was involved in politics. So I would imagine that John Carlisle, and of course they were all, you know, we all know what the colonels was, right? Mm -hmm. wasn't He wasn't a military colonel. It's like Colonel Beam wasn't a military colonel, right? Colonel was, Blanton. He didn't play basketball. I was to say it was an ABA basketball team. <laughs> colonel right? Blanton wasn't a, a military colonel. How wasn't it wild? They all had the same rank. We all know what that is, don't we? What a military kids, colonel? Kids what? today, you don't yeah. know what a colonel is. I'm Colonel Lubbers. I'm Colonel. Oh, you Lubbers. mean the Kentucky colonels? They're all Sorry. Kentucky oh, colonels, there right? We go. And like... that is a what kind of organization? A political type of organization, right? So, so that's he. He found good lobbyists See, and we're good even people. Schooled, today. yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Contained the woodshed here, you know. So, so that's you know. They, so, and like like. Mr. Bernheim wasn't particularly for it, but he had a lot of people that were out there who were who were trying to to to, to uh, who saw the big uh, a big the big picture. And I, like I said, I think Mr. Bernheim would be proud that that uh, you know the way it turned out. I mean, during this whole time, there had to have been a lot of people, as you said, that were lobbying. Like, do you know of anything that maybe would have done? under the table or palms that were greased or anything like that to be well, able to kind of move Well, we just saw this. it, the, the vodka and gin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that was a, it's that's just a, a you know, that's stab whatever. in the back, yeah. I mean, it had to be, and there, there's a lot of talk that they, these, these uh, wooden containers, that that was the barrel cooperage uh, lobby who lobbied for that, that it had to be stored for two years. And in it had to be a barrel. brand new yeah, brand charred new barrel. barrel because the Cooper, you know, the Coopers were big. There was tons of, because everything was shipped in barrels. And as other materials came came to be, like the steel drum and the container ships and things like that in the 1960s, that's when that starts going on, um, they came under fire. 
no pun intended. So, you know, they were <laughs> trying to find anything they could to make sure that their industry was safe. We're not going to let these plastic barrels. So I'm sure, there was, <laughs> I'm sure there was lots of $100 handshakes being handed out back then. And, you know, that's how politics works. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. So I, I've got a note here that, that President Grover Cleveland signed this bill in on, on March 3rd, 1897, as you had said earlier. Now, at that time, we knew that, you know, this was... Uh, Cheers to President Cleveland. There you go. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. <laughs> uh, and, and this is at a time when, uh, you know, as you said, whiskey's still going. This is uh, before Prohibition. And there were a lot of, I mean, was at this at this point, was was everybody making bottled and bond? Was like people were really trying to strive there? Or were there a lot of brands that just ceased to exist after that That for, for bottled and bond? Like, I guess I guess a better question is, is what percentage of bottled and bonds have we lost over that period of time? We lost a lot. So it took a long time for people to realize what bottle and bond was. You know, here we are 100, 120 years later, and I'm telling you what bottle and bond is. We were hearing this for the first time. So it's like we're going back from square one. So companies had to, you know, that's why we put on the labels. We weren't bottling things before the bottle and bond act either. You were just, we were just sending barrels out to places. Bottling lines cost money. And they cost a lot of money now. And imagine back then, it was all hands-on. It was yeah. all hand-filling and hand-labeling and all that kind of stuff. So you didn't want to screw with that. That's money. It's easier for me just to send a barrel over to you. But it would be much easier for you to mess with that barrel and top it off with water or lower the proof, you know, whatever. So if, is that really old crow in that, la- in, that, in that barrel? It doesn't taste like it did six months ago out of that barrel, you know. So one way to, to ensure the quality of your product was to bottle it. And now because of the Bottle and Bond Act and words on labels mean things, now you saw things being bottled. So that brought about that. Then they had to educate. So here's a letter from, which one of you wants to read this? I'm gonna go, I'll, I'll go ahead and read this one. Okay, so. There's a cool letter, Ooh, old and it's from 1909. I will say, uh-huh. so it has the old granddad seal up on here, and mm-hmm. it's, um, I can't even say, where is, where is it from? I see. Brent Falls. Look at that um, beautiful. There's two two locations for this. This is a really cool piece of history, and it tells you, and, it, and Louisville's involved in this. So right. where, where, where's, there's, there's, I'll, two, I'll, there's I'll, two addresses on here. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start. It says, gentlemen, we wish to advise that the demand we have been having for our old granddad bottle and bond under our uh, lake lab, label, label, probably is what it is, and under private labels are, of our customers has been very heavy in the last 60 days that we have been unable to fill the orders as promptly as customary with us. By the way, it's not that I'm bad at reading. It's just this is this was on a real typewriter. There's <laughs> yeah. kind of mistakes on it. So <laughs> I might be from Kentucky, but I can read. They're yeah. they running low on toner. <laughs> Mr. Wathen's secretary. Mr. Wathen's secretary wasn't all that good. Yeah. Therefore, we are writing to inform you that should you desire any of our goods to be bottled and bond under our label or yours. For your Christmas trade, it would be well for you to favor us with your order. Uh, what's it say? Before the amounts you would, or for the amounts that you want, <laughs> even though you would not care to have shipment made until December first. For by having the orders now, it will enable us to be able to get the shipments out on the date you desire. Hoping, therefore, if interested, that we will have the pleasure of hearing from you at an early date. With our best wishes, uh, we are very yours truly, Spring Old Granddad Christmas. Distillery. By O.H. Wathen. Mm-hmm. So that's 1909. And that happens to be the same year that the Taft decision was made. But so it looks like it took from 1897 to 1909 to people to really understand what it was. And they saw that it was a quality st- stamp that was on these labels. And they started demanding. So this guy's saying, look, if you want to his distributor. Yeah. We're running out of this stuff. So you better, or bottle early. and bond was like it's taken off, just like it took 30 years for small batch and single barrels to take off, and that's what everybody wants. You couldn't give it away. Remember, Pappy sat on the shelf at $89, 23-year-olds, you know, case deep. You know, people didn't want older whiskey back then. That's kind of a new thing. So bottle and bond was a new thing. But here we have, historically, this letter in 1909 saying it's taken off. And so it, then we had prohibition, of course. So prohibition, here's the only way you could get whiskey, and I'm holding up a prescription. And it was bottle and bond. So this is, I just uh, handed uh, Ryan a 
the bottle of old granddad that I just happen to have. Um, and it's from the, what's the, what's the seasons on it? Uh, made in spring of 1917, bottled in spring of 1932. Mm-hmm. So that's a big gap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because you couldn't make yeah. whiskey during Prohibition. You had to right. make whiskey before. So only, the only time we ever had older whiskey was during Prohibition like this. And people didn't want it, really. They wanted the four, five, and six-year-old stuff. Uh, we drink the 17 year old stuff if we had to, you know, you know, so, so, so. but this is the only way you could get it was <laughs> a doctor's prescription. Changed. So, and that's a pint bottle. So you can only get it and it came in a box cause it says, it says uh, medicine, right? On mm-hmm. front of it. Yep. So this poor lady here, Carrie Augustus in 1931, she became so ill that, uh, they, she had to get a prescription, and I hope she pulled through, right? I really do. Um, so the, the, for, the, the, for the sake of this, this podcast. The prescription that Dr. Hand wrote here was whiskey, wine glass full, thrice daily. Right? <laughs> I hope the poor dear pulled through, right? right. Um, so people still during, during Prohibition, bottle and bond was the good stuff, right? It's what was the industry standard. It was what, what people got. So it became... And after Prohibition, it's what uh, distilleries strive to be. Because during Prohibition, you still had Hiram Walker making a Canadian club. You still had Sam Bronfman uh, making uh, Seagram's, VO, and all that, which were not, pro, you know, they had no Prohibition up there. So they, were, you know, that, they, they didn't miss a beat, and they had aged, aged stuff like this. So when Heaven Hill and other distilleries start back up after Prohibition, we make barrel serial number one on December 13th, 1935. Other distilleries make their barrel number ones. They're not going to make blended whiskey because they don't want to compete with, you know, Sam Walton, uh, you know, or Warren Buffett mm-hmm. or Bill Gates. Gosh, they got it down and they got aged stocks. They don't have bottle and bond, though. That's going to make us different. And people are going to want that bottle and bond again. So Heaven Hill uh, Gold Label bottle and bond comes out in 1939, and that be yes. Yeah, so, and bottle and bonds were back on the map. Okay. So yes, uh, it came back in a big way. Um, here's uh, from the Kentucky Standard, the Bardstown paper. Oh yeah. They ran this uh, as a you know what was happening 50 years ago this past year. And this says that my basketball scores. Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're are you from, from Bardstown? Yeah. Well, you can read it. But this. Liquor worth $840 on July 26, 1956 from the Bloomfield Liquor Store in Bloomfield was burglarized. Liquor valued at $840 was stolen. Most of the whiskey stolen was bottle and bond. The best in the store, (laughs) owner Dr. Harry Plock said. You know, the thieves didn't want wine. Bottles of wine were taken from the shelves and left on the floor. The cases filled with the whiskey. Four-fifths of scotch were taken from the shelf. Two cases of wine taken from the store and were carried outside and left. (laughs) They only took the bottle and bond stuff. I was surprised the scotch wasn't, like, broken out front, you know, sitting on this. Bottle and bond is what everybody wanted. But it's according to Max, our our president and one of our family owners, this was the time that there started to be a whiskey glut in the market. And that's what happened to Bottle and Bond. It kind of went, it went away because um, you had uh, the Korean conflict. And during World War I and World War II, we were supposed to make high-proof alcohol for the war effort. So we weren't being able to make whiskey. And so they said, well, we're not going to, you know, we know we're going to go into Korea, looks like. So let's ramp up production so that when they come to us and say we got to make high-proof alcohol for the war effort, we're not stuck short. And they never did. The technology changed, and so there what was, was this the high proof glut. liquor for the war for it. What it, what is that used for? Uh, it was to, to make parachutes and different synthetics. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, so then you had this glut, and then you also had the introduction of two new spirits that were never in the market, the U.S. market, which was uh, vodka and tequila, and that's when they started seeing the lowering of proofs down to eighty and eighty six proof to, to to more compete with gins. And the golden whiskey era and, and stuff and like that. And so you, that's when whiskey starts all going away. Right. And that's when we're just now at 6.7 million barrels in inventory uh, if, as an industry. Just now equaling what was the high in 1974. So we're just getting back to where we were. And most of your bottle and bonds went away. Well, Heaven Hill, we keep, we don't change a whole lot. I mean, this old Fitzgerald bottle and bond, we didn't change that label. That's the label from whenever... 
long time ago. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that old, mellow corn hilarious, label right? is from 1945. We have never changed it. You know, these old Heaven Hill labels, they don't change much, you know. And so we like, we don't, we don't I think the marketing teams appreciate that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So let's go ahead. You know, we've, we've, this has been awesome because we've really <coughs> dove into the history. A lot of information. Dove into the reason why. And this, is, <laughs> this has been fantastic. But I want to kind of go to today. Um, mm-hmm. What's the importance of actually having bottled the bond today? Because we don't have people that are, you know, you don't have, you don't have a, a jar of Bernie spit that we're pouring into bottles mm-hmm. of Elijah Craig. We don't I saw have some skull being spit. You know, <laughs> <back>. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, this is, this is a, a different era when uh, you just, you shouldn't, I don't think you should have to worry about that. We don't have, you know, we still have what are technically considered uh, bonded warehouses, but the government isn't coming. They're not, they're not sitting there with another lock and key and they're not checking it. So what's, what's the point of having a uh, bottle and bond today? Trust me, the government is coming and they do have keys <laughs> and they do levy a lot of, um, I think we get, we get audited on a regular basis. So we haven't had agents to live on the distillery since the late sixties, early seventies. So sure. And I've even had other distillers say, you're talking about bottle and bond. It's from a, a bygone era, uh, it, it, just like just like you just said. And if that's the case, if it doesn't mean anything, why is it still in the books? It's right here. I mean, if you're going to say that, well, let's just throw out the rules for bo- a bourbon too. Well, it's not that. I mean, yeah. it's 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 not the the rules can always be there, right? I mean, it's the whole thing of you know. I, get I'm not. I'm not. I'm not allowed to walk around with an ice cream cone in my back pocket in Lexington. Yeah. But <laughs> well, my but, point but is, nobody's, nobody's gonna, have, but nobody's going to yeah, do it. But why have the bourbon law? Well, I'm just saying. Well, why have? Why would everybody want to start making bottled and bond still when you could just say, "Oh, we'll just go ahead and." Is it just a just to have another oh, batch? Trust me, it's hard to make bottled and bond. <laughs> mm-hmm. You have to have enough whiskey that you're producing to feed the engine that pulls your train. The engine that pulls the Heaven Hill train is Evan Williams. Uh, the engine that pulls Jim Beam's train is Jim Beam, white label Jim Beam. The engine that pulls uh, Brown Foreman's train is Jack Daniels. The one that uh, pulls uh, Buffalo Trace is Buffalo Trace, right? Wild Turkey, the Wild Turkey 101. So you have to have enough for that engine. Then, and only then, can you come out with you know, your Parkers, your unicorns, if you will, your, your different ones, your barrel proofs, your corn whiskeys, your desk whiskey, whatever you're going to have. And then on top of it, you got to have enough that you make in a six month period to be a bottle and bond. Well, that just shows you, you got to be a pretty big distillery. Mm-hmm. And then you got to have the wherewithal to, to do that because trust me, we're audited every couple of years. The government is coming and they're knocking on the door and there's several people to come in and they check. And we usually have to pay money when they leave because... Uh, you know, this has to be the proof gallons have to be exactly 100 proof. They don't care if it's 100, 101, right? Because, uh, uh, well, they don't care if it's 90, 98, right? And you're paying money on 100. Yeah. They worry if it's 101 and you're only paying on 100. 100. And so they're doing, they're, they're doing the things and they usually, usually end up paying money because the reason they only audit us. It's because we have money. They're not going to come to Bob, <laughs> whose poor brother-in-law has already paid $5 million for the, the still. Neurosurgeons. They don't have any money to pay, right? And they don't have enough. So they're going to come after the big guy. We're more regulated than anybody because we have money, right? And so, yes, it's still on the books. And the reason you don't see them is because they're not high-volume right. products. Absolutely. So you don't see other big distilleries because you're not going to mess with them. But recently, Jim Beam came out with their uh, bottle and bomb. Uh, and you have uh, uh, the 1897 from, uh, from Brown. Old Forster. Old yeah. Forster. You know, what do you think's there? brought that back, the interest in the bottle and bond? Well, uh, He's, he's going to argue that it never, it never disappeared. <laughs> if you read Fred Minnick's book, Bourbon Curious, he credits uh, Heaven Hill and myself with bringing it back because it takes some advocates to bring it back. And I've traveled over the country, and Heaven Hill has more than anybody. And so we have four, five really national bottle and bonds now. We have, we have the Evan Williams bottle and bond. We have Rittenhouse bottle and bond. We have Mellow Corn bottle and bond. And we have Henry McKenna bottle and bond, the oldest eight state of bottle and bond on the planet. Uh, we have those four that are national. And then this year's Parker's was. Uh, that was, bond. but that's not every year. Right. We have uh, this bottle and bond uh, brandy. 
which is the only bottle of Bond grape brandy in the world. Oh, and I did so, not know that. Uh, it just came out with that. So we have five. This is not national yet. We're just, but it's going to be. It's uh, it's being very well received. So uh, we have them, and so we've been talking about them for the last five years, and nobody else really has, and because uh, they don't have them. <laughs> I mean, and it's not important to Jimmy and Eddie uh, Russell. They have, they're known for 101. They can't be bottle and bond. So it's not a big deal over there. You know, they have their heritage and what they talk about. But to Heaven Hill, it's damn, damn important. And it's damn, and, it, and it's really exciting. It's, has this been a fascinating talk? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so it's a lot to talk about. I mean, I've got a letter from 1909. Right? <laughs> and I, I can I've barely got this read poor it. lady who just barely pulled through in 1933. Poor, poor Carrie. You know, it does mean something. But not everybody can talk about it because they don't have it. I mean, right now... You've learned. So read the date on there, Ken. I'll read go ahead the, and read, read it. Read the date. So, we've so got, when was it barreled? We've got February 3rd of 2003, barrel number 988. Uh, so what season was that made in? Do I need to look on the... There's no tax now, for Think it. about it. Think about it. Spring season is what? And fall season is what? Oh, sorry. So that we, yeah, it would be in the fall, right? Uh, or wait, spring it, is January through June. Oh, okay. Then it would definitely be spring, right? <laughs> so right so there. how much I'm paying attention. So all of a sudden, right? we're learning, right? We we're fail. learning, right? You know, some take a little longer to learn, <laughs> but, <laughs> if it's not but computers, this is he this was never... distilled in the spring of 2003. That's pretty cool to know. I mean, how many bottles on a back bar or on a, in a shelf? Not any. Can you <laughs> learn? From somebody who's, and if they don't have the word straight, hmm, I got questions. So that means this is not how old, if it doesn't have Four it on years. there. Or two straight. years for straight. Two, two years. years for and straight. what can you do on top of it? You can add things to it. You can add caramel colors and flavors and sugars. Well, straight, you can only add pure water. In Bal and Bond, you can only add pure water. So that word straight is extremely important. So if I don't see the word straight, I'm going to not buy that product. So we need a label checklist. Like when we're going down the aisle, what, what, go through the checklist. I guess we're going through right now. This is all on my website. You can yeah. all know how to read a label and all in bottle and bond. So it's very interesting. You know, there's people out there paying $100 a bottle for something that's eight months old. Oh, yeah. You see it all the time. It's, it's insane. And here is a bottle of six-year-old bottle and bond. The Eagle Scout, right? The the the, the Green Beret, and it's twelve ninety nine. The people. And by the way, we're talking about the uh, Heaven Hill Heaven bottle Hill. of bond six years. It's a Kentucky only product. I tell people, you're stepping on bricks of gold to grab gold dust. Right? <laughs> Now, you should always grab gold dust. It's not there all the time. So those little unicorn bottles, you know, everybody wants the gold dust. Oh, my God. I gotta grab. So grab, you know, grab the gold dust, but pick up the gold brick that you just stepped on to get up to that gold dust. And that's there every day. So always grab the gold dust, but always pick up the brick of gold. Well, this has been uh, fascinating, I think, <laughs> in my opinion. You know, we've, we've learned a lot. You know, I, I knew coming into here, I kind of knew the basics, right? But I had never actually gone to the uh, the depth of, of reading the laws, trying to understand <laughs> a little bit more and everything like that, and uh, definitely got me put on my toes at the same exact time as well. Yeah, I feel like I stepped back into the classroom you know, in college. You know, That's why like, I'm the whiskey I better, professor. I better pay attention or I'm going to get smacked. <laughs> That's right. So with that, um, unless there's anything else to, to kind of really add about Bottle and Bond that you kind of want to close out with? Well, you know, it's the it's the Eagle Scout, it's the it's the uh, Navy Seal, and it's the Green Beret. So my my challenge to everybody is, go out and buy every single one you can. Yeah, you can buy most of them for the price of those unicorns. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 I call it a four for one deal. The four that I mentioned, it costs about what one E. H. Taylor single barrel does. And you've got not only do you have a single barrel, it's a ten year old H. stated single barrel. That one isn't isn't age stated, but this is. We're not supposed to say Henry McKenna on our show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think it's a four. And, 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 and obviously, I have the age Taylor on my bar. Mm -hmm. It's a phenomenal whiskey. So because it's a it's an Eagle Scout, you know. There's a reason, and they're not ripping you off, by the way. That it's that's eighty dollars a bottle or seventy five or whatever it is. That's single barrel. We're I call Heaven Hill the Reno Nevada of distilleries. We're the biggest little distillery in the world. We make a lot more than they do. So we can charge a little bit less. You know, Max and the family, they'd rather sell, they're going to get the same amount of money whether you sell 12 of something or one of something. Well, we have the strength of having 12 of something to their one of something. So we don't have to charge as much. 
It's pretty simple economics. So they're not ripping you off. They just don't. It's from one finite number of barrels in a six-month period. We have more than they do. So grab, please. You grab everyone you can. You know, We're lucky in Kentucky. We have a lot that the national market doesn't have. We have little brands, you know, very old Barton, VOB. That's not bottle and bond everywhere. We have it here. We have J.W. Dent, J.T.S. Brown, and T.W. Samuel. Some really cool ones that are around. And they around. won't break the bank. Either, yeah. You know. You can buy all. I think there's about 18 available. Well, that's, see, now I need to go add a few more, I guess, to my bar downstairs. <laughs> what's, go what's out a, and what's, get What's them. a few more? What's a few more? So everybody's looking for these dusties, and everybody's looking for these unicorns. Hey, I'm a dusty guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. But... Go out. I mean, the whole idea was this: these things are available every day. Go pick up the bricks of gold. Don't keep stepping on them and putting them back. Well, awesome. So, uh, Bernie, I want to say thank you again and uh, for graciously having us in here, sharing your knowledge uh, and some of your bourbon. And your, yeah, and and your we, bourbon. And, but before we go, I want to... Uh, well, and and also, whiskey. Corn whiskey. Absolutely. Yeah, right. And I got to say uh, thank you for Heaven Hill uh, for you know letting you be able to come and advocate about this because you can definitely tell that you're the man for the job when it comes to <laughs> thank you. talking about bottled and bond. Uh, so <laughs> He's got do, a damn tattoo on his <laughs> I know. He's got the tattoo of it. So uh, if anybody does want to get a hold of you, get in touch with you, Twitter... I'm on Facebook. Bernie Lovers at Twitter. I'm on Facebook uh, and uh, and my, my website whiskeyprof.com. So if you can't get in touch with me, something's wrong. Awesome. So again, just, Twitter's Bernie Lovers, Facebook's Bernie Lovers, and whiskeyprof.com. There we go. Perfect. How do you spell lovers? L u b b e r s. Awesome. <laughs> For anybody that was wondering, uh, and with that, make sure you follow us uh, at Bourbon Pursuit on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you do like what you hear, if you learned a lot of great stuff, make sure you support the show. We're gonna try and uh, have a one or two more of these uh, in the hopper for uh, for the the month month of March because uh, we kind of really want to focus back on the uh, the basics of bourbon. So uh, get look forward to the the next few podcasts that are coming out uh, and support the show on Patreon. That's p a t r e o n dot com slash bourbon pursuit. Yeah, I, I really am enjoying this series and that we're doing it because you know as, as a bourbon hunter, it's been frustrating trying to chase these unicorns. And my goal this year was to definitely get back to basics and go to those everyday bottles that you know you you can enjoy at a, an incredible value. So appreciate your, your time, Bernie. That my was my pleasure. Thank you all for my coming brain's about to come about to Burns Corner, making it easy. <laughs> oh, and we're, I'm gonna hang out a little bit more. I, I, like I said, I got an Uber thing. Uber right here, so I'm ready to go. But uh, no, Along thank with you. Some of these sample bottles. Eh? Oh yeah, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> But thanks again, and, and, and guys, if you have any show suggestions, comments, feedback, please let us know. Um, we're here to bring the content you know, to you, so just let us know what you want to hear, and we'll see you next time. had a funny story about Parker when he people would say they sit around and they, they smell this certain thing in the bourbon he goes, I don't know what they're talking about. It's just it's just rye and corn. Yeah. So he said, I smell I, I, I taste banana in there. He goes, I didn't put no damn banana in there. He says, I taste good bourbon. That was always his line. Yeah. I taste good bourbon.